So this morning, we'd like to look at Revelation 17, beginning in verse 7, and reading to the end of the chapter. We're continuing to look at the whore of Babylon, and we want to uh, delve into the identity, both of the beast and of the whore. So beginning in verse 7, it says this, The angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her which hath seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. They have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And again, God always blesses the reading from his precious word to us. Now we said uh, that Revelation 17 is full of symbolic language, but we're so thankful to the Lord that he, in his grace, he explains the symbolism for us very clearly. And so as we look at this chapter, uh, it divides up very nicely into two sections. And we covered the first six verses last time, one through six. And because one through six begins with this thought uh, in verse one, uh, there came one of the seven angels, which hath seven vials and talked with me saying unto me, come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great war that's whore that sits upon many waters. So I want to just focus on this phrase, I will show unto thee. And so really it's he's basically it's a description of the vision of the whore riding the beast. And so it's really verses one through six is describing the vision, what it is that John was looking at. Then we get to verse 7 down to 18, and I want you to notice verse 1. In verse 7, it says, And the angel said to me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. So 1 through 6, I will show thee. 7 through 18, I will tell thee. So it's kind of the explanation, the explaining of the vision. And I want you to notice just as a general observation from the text, and I, I kind of love this, this kind of thing where you, you see things in the text, but I want you to notice how he goes about the explanation. And so in verse eight, notice he says, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and then he goes on and explains the beast, okay? The beast that thou sawest was. Verse 12, the 10 horns which thou sawest are. So he explains what the 10 horns are. Verse 15, he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are. So again, he's explaining what the, the fact that she sits on many waters, what does that exactly mean? And verse 18, and the woman that which thou sawest is. And so again, now he's getting specific. What is this woman? And so it's very nicely laid out 
how he's shown the vision and then the vision is explained. And that's so nice when we're dealing with symbolic language is not left to our fertile imaginations to try and figure out what it is. Uh, the Holy Spirit in his grace and mercy has shown us both what the vision is and what it actually means. He gives the explanation. And the focus of the explanation, although it's dealing with the judgment of the great whore, it seems that much of the focus of the explanation is on the beast. It appears that the harlot ruled, she rode on top of the the beast system, the antichrist system, but but he is the dynamic factor. Using her as tyrants have always used religion as a mere tool to accomplish their purposes. And so we're going to see that, that actually, although she feels like she's in control and she's riding the beast, actually, this is all uh, being used for the purposes of forwarding the agenda of the beast. And we'll see that unfold as we go through this particular chapter. And so in verse eight, it says, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is and so the beast we notice first of all that comes up out of the bottomless pit he was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and we've already seen this bottomless pit. We've looked at the bottomless pit in previous studies. And of course, it speaks of the abyss. And uh, I want to just look back in Revelation and see how the abyss has been referred to. Previous passages, chapter 11, verse 7. It says, <clears throat> verse, speaking of the two witnesses, uh, chapter 11, verse 7, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street. And it goes on and says, who can make war with the beast and all the rest of it. So again, it seems to be the, the place where Satan was <laughs> and comes out and energizes this uh, this beast, this uh, this man of sin, and uh, uses him. Uh, back in chapter 9, uh, we saw it was also the place where demons had been held, uh, awaiting a specific hour. A fifth angel sounded, I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as a smoke of great furnace. The sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So quite clearly, what it's just telling us is that the beast who was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, it, it, that basically th this the power behind this world ruler is none other than Satan himself. It's satanic power, satanic energy that is or demonic, we want if you want to put it that way, that is behind this beast. And verse, if you look at chapter 13, verse 4, they worship the dragon which gave power to the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like to the beast, who is able to make war with him? So again, just want to see this that this this whore is riding this beast, and the beast he says uh, concerning it, it was and is not. We'll think about what that particularly means in a moment and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So, so there's a point where it becomes a very dim, demonic, satanic uh, uh, beast. And so how does all that work? Well, let me just suggest that, um, again, the power, uh, Satan and the man that, that he controls are closely identified. And the power behind uh, th this beast is none other than Satan. The, the fact that the beast was... Uh, now is not and will come up in the future is is something that we've seen back in verse 3 of chapter 13. So let's go back there and we'll see what we're talking about here. See, <clears throat> this, uh, let me just put it this way, this man of sin, this, this antichrist person comes onto the world stage. Uh, he's back in Revelation 6. He's the one riding on the white horse. Uh, he comes and peacefully 
uh, solves much of the world's problems. The world's crying out for such a man. Uh, and so he's a slick politician that is able to make a covenant with Israel to protect them for seven years. He's he's this individual we've thought much about as we've gone through the book. But when we get to chapter 13, he says, I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death. And so there comes a point where this, this great slick personality uh, that has uh, won the world over and is considered to be the answer to the world's problems, it says... It was as his one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And so there's some kind of assassination attempt, and it seems like this man who has done so much to bring peace to the earth is killed. But then it says his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered at the beast. And so the supernatural survival and revival of the world ruler and his empire will impress the world as being supernatural and will lead to worship of the beast and of Satan. And I want you to notice, by the way, that all is not as it seems, because we pointed this out at the time, but it's good to remind ourselves, refresh ourselves. It says, I saw one of the heads as it were wounded. In other words, there's something just not right about this whole picture. It looks like he died and is risen again. It looks like, uh, again, remember he's a counterfeit. He wants to counterfeit the true Christ. And so this antichrist figure is going to have his own seeming death and resurrection. But the very phrase, as it were, shows that all is not as it seems. The whole thing is a sham. Uh, it's a presumption of death and a pseudo resurrection. And what's going to happen is, yes, he will have a, a wound. <laughs> it will seem like it's deadly. It will be healed. Uh, and uh, but part of that process will be that he will become, many believe, uh, satanically indwelt, just as the Lord Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. That's great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Here is the mystery of iniquity uh, in its fullness, where, where basically this evil personage that has deceived the nations will, as it were, come and indwell this individual. And of course, we've seen something of that with Judas. Remember, Satan entered into him. Uh, we saw that in our study of John's gospel. And so here, this son of perdition, Mark 2, uh, just like Judas was the son of perdition, Mark 1, here's Mark 2 version, and again, he gives himself over fully to Satan's control. And so as a result of that, back again to our passage in chapter 17, he says, <clears throat> verse 8, uh, the one who was, that's the beginning of his career, that first half of the tribulation period, and is not, that's his seemingly deadly wound assassination, uh, kind of the end of his career, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. He will become literally indwelt by this evil power. And so, and but notice too, every time it seems in scripture, we have some kind of revelation of this coming world leader, immediately it tells of his demise. And I love this. Notice it says, he was and is not and shall ascend to the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. <laughs> I just love that, that it's almost like when he's revealed, even at the pinnacle of his power, the Lord says, and he goes into perdition. In other words, he's going to end. He's not, his career will be interrupted and he will receive divine judgment. And so he will go into perdition. And we see that in many other examples uh, in scripture. Some of them we'll look at this morning uh, as we proceed, Lord willing. But I just want us to see that for now. Move on now to verse, oh, by the way, it, uh, verse 8, continuing. It says, going to petition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And so there's going to be a tremendous response from the world. Uh, again, we just think of this, that, that when Christ came, the general response was they rejected the true Messiah. But when this false Messiah with this pseudo-resurrection comes along, the world, 
the inhabitants of the world will wonder. They'll marvel at this, this seeming resurrection of this false messiah. And uh, they'll believe him and, and the world will go after him. Except it tells us those whose names were, were it's those whose names were not written in the book of life from before the foundation of the world. Now, again, lots of ways we can look at that, but let me just say this. The, it, it's not that the Lord um, determined before the world began that so, you know, a number of people would be saved and the rest would be damned. That's not the thought because scripture tells us he'll have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It tells us that he's not willing that any should perish. And so there's not some double standard with God here. But the thought is this, that God in his foreknowledge, is, foreknowledge knows every person that will believe in his son. And he knew it before the world began. Right, nothing catches him by surprise. He knows exactly the the future is as it's already passed, as far as he's concerned, uh, because of of God's amazing omniscience and the omniscience of the Lord Jesus too. He knows, and he knows those who will, in space time history, believe the gospel, and those whose names are in the Lamb's book of life. He knows that, and it's not a surprise to him. But on the other hand, uh, those that whose names are not written who he knew would not believe. Again, he doesn't coerce it. He doesn't make it happen. He just knows. He knows the responses of the hearts of men before they happen. It says these, they wonder at the beast. <laughs> and so, again, it's just very clear that uh, it won't be everybody. There will be those who are true believers who will not wonder at the beast. In fact, those tribulation saints will expect this they you know they'll they'll know the book of revelation they'll expect these things to happen and so it won't surprise them but again those uh, that are not written in the lamb's book of life they will somehow uh, be just mesmerized by this whole event <clears throat> notice now verse 9 here is the mind that hath wisdom he says the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits so again he's describing things that were seen in the vision in the previous section and verses one through uh, seven uh, and so part of what was seen is that she would seem to be sitting on seven uh seven heads and um and so what what are these seven heads and so he he, he tells us the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So what, what are the mountains that he's speaking of? Now, let's just look back again. Let's let scripture interpret scripture. And we'll go back to the book of Daniel. And a lot of this is review. I think we kind of covered some of this when we were in chapter 13 of Revelation. But uh, it's it's sometimes good to review these things. What what does he actually mean by mountains? Daniel two and verse thirty five. We read this. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, we know that this stone made without hands destroys this image of the, the Gentile nations, and it, it, it destroys them, crushes them. But we know that this, this stone made without hands is speaking of Christ, but then it goes on and says, becomes a great mountain that filled the whole earth. So what does that mean? Look at verse 44. It says, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So this great mountain that's being described here is the kingdom of Christ. He will come, uh, and again, uh, 
the world uh, will not be converted gradually. This is a this is the coming of Christ in a catastrophic event where he comes and destroys the uh, these Gentile nations that have ruled uh, this this image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, and he will set up a kingdom, that mountain, which will uh, cover the whole earth and uh, which will never be destroyed. So we can say without uh, fear of contradiction, that mountain is equivalent to kingdom. And so the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, or seven kingdoms. Now, let me just say this, that many Bible students quickly associate the seven mountains that are mentioned here with Rome, uh, the city of Rome, which is built on seven hills. And so they, they, they clearly see the papacy here uh, because Rome is well known as the, the city on seven hills. Yet literally the Greek word here is not seven hills, it's seven mountains. So we've got to be careful of that. It's not, we're not talking about hills, we're talking about mountains. And um, those commentators who see all of Revelation fulfilled in history, so I'll give you an example. This is Adam Clark. He was a famous commentator of the methodist movement his commentary has a lot of helpful things in it but but again eschatologically is really mixed up and this is what he says regarding the seven mountains as irrefutable connection with rome clark is is a good example he writes the verse has been almost universally considered to allude to the seven hills upon which rome originally stood but as we've already said in the bible mountains are are used as a figure of governments or kingdoms. And the city of Rome is built on hills, not on mountains. Now, let me just kind of say this. I, again, I believe these, and we're going to explain what these seven uh, kingdoms are. Uh, and notice verse 10, it says, and there are seven kings. With kingdoms come kings. And so the fact that there are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth and there are seven kings would clearly, I think, affirm that we're talking about kingdoms and kings. But before we do that, let me just, I want to talk a little bit about Rome just for a moment. And uh, we, we would say uh, this, that the Roman uh, Catholic system will certainly be very much a part of the whore of Babylon, but not totally. But let me just say this, that I, I do believe that after the rapture of the church, when the true church is taken out, that the Roman church, which much of it will still be here. Uh, and again, because, because their gospel is a gospel of works. Faith in Christ plus good works equals justification. Nobody can tell you how many good works you have to do. It's not faith alone in Christ alone. And so it's a false system, a false gospel. And so as a result of that, multitudes will be left behind and Rome will continue on. But there will be a quick attempt to bring a unity of all the apostate religions that are left behind after the rapture, including apostate Christianity, but other world religions, and to unite. And let me just show you this. I find this is very interesting because um, we can see these tendencies already at work within Roman Catholicism. I mentioned last week. I don't know whether it was in the actual message or the question and answer session, but we talked about the fact that John uh, Paul II, Pope John Paul II, had brought together the world religions to Assisi in Italy. And it was a council of world religions to basically say, how can we go beyond ecumenism, which is the gathering together of all aspects of Christianity under a Roman umbrella, to a world religious unity. And so let's just give some more thought to this. Um, he addressed this prayer gathering, uh, did Pope John Paul, uh, in Assisi, Italy, uh, and it was comprised of, of supposedly professing Christians, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, uh, shaman, North American Indian shaman, you know, people from every religious walk of life you could imagine. And Pope John Paul II told the participants that their efforts were unleashing profound spiritual energies. In the world, 
and bringing about a new climate of peace. Now, let me just say that again. This is what he said, unleashing profound spiritual energies in the world and bringing about a new climate of peace. Well, I definitely believe that this isn't unleashing spiritual energies, but it's not the energy of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's a demonic energy that's at work here. And then he, he, the Pope pledged that the Catholic Church intends to share in and promote such ecumenical and interreligious cooperation. The Catholic Review, writing about this event, made this comment. The unity of religion promoted by the Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, and approved by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, is not a goal to be achieved immediately. But a day may come when the love and compassion which both Buddha and Christ preached so eloquently will unite the world in a common effort to save humanity from senseless destruction and lead toward the light in which we all believe. Now, I want you to get that last statement. Lead toward the light in which we all believe. Now, what is the light that both Buddha, Catholicism, Islam, all believe in? Satan manifests himself as an angel of light. It's not the Lord Jesus who is the light of the world. Buddhists do not have any thought that the Lord Jesus is the light of the world. The Dalai Lama doesn't see that. Islam doesn't see that. And so clearly, uh, this is where this is all heading. So we certainly can see that. I want to see that. But I want to just say that this, in interpreting this text, we're, not, we're saying this is not Rome. Rome is definitely the part of the whore system. Uh, probably a leading role in it. But but Mystery Babylon is much bigger than Rome. It existed before Rome, and uh, it certainly uh, has existed, as we're going to see when we look at these seven mountains which the woman sits. Uh, it goes a lot further than that. But what it does tell us is this. In the end time, particularly after the church is raptured in the first half of the tribulation period, there's going to be an alliance between the end time ruler, the Antichrist, and the apostate religions of the world. And that's, we're moving towards that. The church is still here, it's not going to be fully revealed, but we can see it already beginning to unfold before our eyes. And so he says, uh, verse 10, there are seven kings because, you know, seven mountains equals seven kingdoms. Uh, on which the woman sits, there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come, and when he comes, he must continue a short space. So, we said with kingdoms come kings, seven kings that have all nurtured mystery Babylon, and were connected with, with the persecution of Israel, with anti-Semitic activity, he says, these seven kings Five are fallen. So he's not talking about kings that live together at the same time, but kings that have, have gone in the past. Five kings, five are fallen. And then he says, five are fallen. Well, one is, so as he writes, there's a, there's, there's a king that's supportive of Mystery Babylon at that moment when he writes, John writes, and then one is not yet come. In other words, he's still future. So let's go through these. And I want to just suggest, again, that this is quite clear in Scripture. Remember when the, the ba Babylonian system began at the Tower of Babel, and when the, the languages were confused, they carried the, the, the Babylonian religious ideas with them wherever they went. So five are fallen. Number one, Egypt and Pharaoh. That will be the first kingdom that, again, was very much mystery Babylon, promoting uh, these false ideas, false conceptions that began at Babel. That's fallen. But again, persecuted Israel. Assyria, Sennacherib, you know, with kingdoms come kings. Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, that's number three. Persia, Ahasuerus. Number five, Greece, and particularly Antiochus Epiphanes. Then he says, one is a 
as John writes, or well, what is the one is when John writes? It's Rome and it's Caesar. John is in Patmos right now at his bidding. Uh, again, Rome carried on that mystery Babylon system. And the other is not yet. What is that not yet that is, well, it's going to be what we call the revived Roman Empire of the last days when God will bring together uh, a revival, a revival of this empire that has long been dormant. It's going to come alive again in the last days. Notice verse 11, the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. So here we have an interesting thing. I believe that the, the kingdom of the beast will be the seventh, Right? This is the revived Roman Empire. He will be the emperor. But he goes on and says, and goeth in uh, and is the eighth, <laughs> and, and is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. And again, we've got that goes into perdition again. So what is this about? Just like we've seen in our previous comments, the kingdom of the beast will be the seventh, and at the same time, it will be the eighth. Now, it's interesting. Seven is the number of completeness. Right? So, so this is the, the, the completed nature of all of kind of the Babylonian systems is going to find its kind of completeness. But eight is the number of resurrection. And so, again, remember, we saw this man of sin going to be uh, executed at the midpoint. He's the seventh, but he will be the eighth. And then it says he goes into perdition and that pseudo resurrection. The one who had wounds by a sword and did live. And so it marks a transition from just a, a human government to a supernatural power working through that ruler. And so verse 12, it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. <laughs> So ten horns, you know, in scripture, horn is symbolic of power. Uh, you have back in Daniel, remember the uh, the the horns of the 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 ram and uh, uh, and and the he goat, and they're they're butting heads with each other. And later on, we see that it's actually the Medo Persian Empire and the Greek Empire uh, at loggerheads together, fighting together. And so, horn symbolic of power, and we see that uh, where we live here, we have. Um, the uh, Bass Pro Shops began in Springfield, Missouri, and we have we have the World of Wildlife Museum. And as you go in there, uh, one of the, the one of the halls is full of the, the the horns and antlers of all kinds of creatures that have been hunted through the years. And again, it's the symbol of power, isn't it? And the one with the biggest horns wins, so to speak. And so that's the picture here. And so we we, we notice um, that. Uh, these ten horns, symbolic of power. And we, we've seen it already. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. Uh, it says, I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Uh, we, we saw it in this vision in chapter 17, verse 3. So it carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So again, symbolic of, of power. And of course, we see that it says, uh, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So king, ten kings, they have no kingdom as yet, but receive power one hour with the beast. And so they're going to just a short time, they'll experience the power uh, shared with the beast and and actually perhaps in subjection to him and of course it it answers to uh, some of the prophecies we've seen back in the book of daniel uh, the image that daniel saw that we've already referred to that was crushed by uh, the stone made without hands i want you just to go back with me there to daniel just for a second and we want to see daniel 2 and we'll look at daniel 7 and daniel 2 and daniel 7 both cover the uh, the same ground. Uh, one is from man's perspective, and so Daniel two, you have this vision uh, of a of a of a, a huge man, 
and his head is gold and then inferior metals coming down to the end and again it's it's the kingdoms of the world from man's perspective and very much glory to man when you look at chapter 7 the same kingdoms are represented by by wild beasts different creatures a leopard a lion uh, so on and so forth and so the idea is that from god's perspective these kingdoms instead of glory to man they actually act like wild animals and of course man left to himself becomes like a wild animal so daniel uh, 2 let's just notice verse 33 daniel 2 33 it says his legs of iron his feet part of iron and part of clay so this is considered to be the ten toes of this image uh, part of iron part of clay an unholy mixture and so uh, that, that again notice uh, the idea of ten his feet part of iron part of clay because ten toes and then the ten horns daniel 7 verse 7 again this final kingdom it says, after this, I saw in the night vision and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong, exceeding. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue of the feet of it. And it was done. So clearly this is a reference back to these events. And so 10 kings that are going to rule with the, the man of sin, this end time ruler, they're going to share with him rule for one hour. In fact, they're going to give, we're going to see their uh, their authority to him. Uh, they have verse, notice verse 13 of chapter 17. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength to the beast. So they, they rule with him to begin with, but eventually they just succumb their power and submit willingly to him. So what that would tell us is this, that this final world empire, this revived Roman empire that many believe, will be a, a confederacy of 10 nations that will come together or 10 regions. While the seven heads are chronological, right, beginning with Egypt and working through until we got to the beast kingdom and then uh, his pseudo-resurrected aspect, the eighth. The seven heads may be chronolo chronological successive rulers as singled out as prominent. The ten horns, by contrast, are contemporaneous. They're together. They each receive political power for a brief time. There are ten kingdoms which will rise out of the fourth great kingdom, uh, Ten European powers, many believe, although it could be much wider than that, we can't be sure, which in the last time, in concert with and in subjection to the anti-Christian power, shall make war against Christ. Now, here's a quote. This is from Dean Alford uh, back in 1866. And it says, uh, in the precise number and form here indicated, they have not yet arisen. What changes in Europe may bring them into the required tale or form is not yet for us to see. But interesting, isn't it? in 1866, Dean Alfred was expecting some kind of revival of the Roman Empire, merging of 10 kingdoms into this, uh, this end time revived Roman Empire. And they're of one mind. Now, many have seen the European Union. It's interesting how it's morphed. It began as the European Economic Community, and then it became the EU, the European Union. And uh, it's interesting that the European Union uh, is certainly sees itself, by the way, as a successor to the ancient Roman Empire. It began in 1957 when six European nations met to talk about combining their nuclear coal and economic resources they met together in rome and signed the treaty of rome the beginning of the present eu and in many places and i've seen this personally the european flag is just as prominent and often more prominent than the national flag of these nations 
And as we marvel at, at men like Alfred back in 1866, anticipating this, but as we could say this with him, in the precise number and form here indicated, they may not yet have arisen. What changes in Europe may bring them into the required tale and form is not easy for us to say, but it will happen. And this confederation of nations will emerge as an heir to the ancient Roman Empire, and it will emerge in the last days. And so we can anticipate that, we can expect that. And again, as, we, as we're living now, we see the things that are happening in our world. And it's amazing to think that we're, in a sense, it seems to me that all the chess pieces are on the board. And I don't believe it's going to be long before we hear the trumpet sound and we're called out of here to meet the Lord in the air. We notice verse 13, these have one mind. There's absolute unity between these nations. And what they're unified on is to give their power and strength to the beast. This ruler must be something. Because for, for politicians to give up power, <laughs> that's not something they do lightly. But they must so wonder and marvel at the beast uh, and and it must be so impressive. And we know he's going to be so eloquent in so many ways, uh, going to um, certainly... Uh, they perhaps certainly at the midpoint when uh, he has this pseudo resurrection event, um, they will certainly willingly give their power and strength unto the beast. Their, their actions are clear, even if their identity is not so clear. They join with the Antichrist. And what do they join him to do? Well, the one thing that you you see that they have one mind to do and not only give their power and strength to the beast it tells us in verse 14 these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them so what we find is that they join with antichrist in the war against christ and we, what we find is that there, there's there's a great antagonism to christ throughout the entire seven years of the tribulation period to the true lamb of god and these nations will certainly exhibit that clearly i just heard this week about finland are actually the, the nation of finland are discussing the banning of christianity they want to ban it because it just doesn't fit with the the current trend of the world and they want to make christianity illegal isn't that amazing and, and again the hostility to christ is intense in the world which we find ourselves in and it's going to get worse and so they're going to make war with the lamb but again we notice their demise they're going to make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them remember this the great theme of revelation is is overcoming uh, victory uh, Nike, Nike, and so he, the Lamb is going to overcome them. <laughs> He's going to defeat them, and what a wonderful uh, thing to be reminded of. And as we look at, uh, we've looked at chapter sixteen. Let's look back there, sixteen and verse twelve, where we see this this great battle, uh, this last battle, and we see the, the sixth angel pours out his vial on the great river Euphrates, and the waters there were dried the way the kings of the east might be prepared. And uh, they're coming together. And what's their, their purpose of all these things? Well, it's to make war with the Lamb. And they're going to come to this great battle. Verse uh, 16, he gathered them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And, of course, the destruction uh, of them is clearly seen in this section where he's going to remember Babylon. Great Babylon came in remembrance before God, and it's going to be destroyed. So clearly, they're not going to be successful in their mission. They will make war with the Lamb, but the Lamb shall overcome them. And then again, we're, re we're reminded who we're talking about when we talk about the Lamb of God. And this is wonderful, isn't it? This Lamb is none other than Lord of Lords, and king of kings. Good to be reminded, brethren, isn't it? That that, that little lamb <laughs> that took away the sin sins of the world is the Lord of Lords, and he's the king of kings. And he's coming to reign in righteousness for a thousand years. 
And notice it says, they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. What a wonderful thing. Those that are with him. You see, when he comes out of heaven, we're going to see that when we get to chapter 19, he's not going to come on his own. He's leading an army, riding white horses. Who are these that are going to be with him? Well, uh, they are those that are called. They've responded to the call of the gospel. They believe that gospel message. They've responded to it. They're now God's choice people. They're, they're now what we call the choice ones because they've believed in God's elect, God's son. And they are with him, are chosen and faithful. And so, again, what a wonderful thing to think that we're going to actually be riding in triumph with Christ to this great victory at the battle of armageddon and we'll we'll be accompanying him to it it's amazing to even staggering to even think of these things and but it's true so when christ returns these 10 kings will war against him but they will be defeated and that lamb as we've said is the lord of lords and king of kings now quickly in verses 15 through 18 we want to see the destruction of the great whore he says unto to me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So again, symbolic language is explained. What are these waters? They're peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And by the way, it's good. We're reminded through the, throughout the book of Revelation that in heaven, there are going to be people from every language and nation and tongue and tribe. And so, but so the, the worldwide impact of the gospel, there'll be people from every group. But sadly, uh, the beast kingdom will also comprise of, of a worldwide entity and, and people from all of these multitudes, nations, and tongues. And again, how sad to think that today, as we look at our world, multitudes are being prepared to receive the beast the agenda is moving forward and and they're they're deceived they don't realize they, the, the deception is so great multitudes are are going to embrace this are going to think this is the answer this is the new way forward this is a way of peace and sadly their the end will be destruction but he says in verse 16 the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, they shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So ten horns, which we saw were ten kings that give their power to the beast, they hate the whore. Now again, remember the, the beast, uh, the whore rides the beast and for the first three and a half years, um, she rides as it were, triumphantly in power with him and again like many as we've said many tyrants throughout history they use religion for their purposes but when he is done with the whore and of course uh, remember whores are used uh, they're used for purposes and once they're done with they're not taken care of they're not looked after they're discarded right? A whore is not, a, there's no commitment with a whore. Uh, you use them and then you're done with them. And so the, the, the whore will be used and then discarded. And so it tells us that um, they hate the whore and shall make her desolate. Now this, I believe, will take place at the midpoint of the tribulation period. For three and a half years, he will, he will ride on world religion this unified religious system and ride to the pinnacle of power. But look at second Thessalonians. We're going to see what's going to happen. And there's going to be a point where he, and again, I believe it will be after his death and pseudo resurrection that he's going to do something. Second Thessalonians two verses three and four. It says, let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Then notice this, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So 
all of these pseudo religions, they're going to be worshiping some God or other. And he is going to oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God. Whatever they call their God, their deity, he's going to oppose it and he's going to exalt himself above it. Uh, any, anything that's worshipped so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself. So that's when he makes this, the abomination of desolation, when he sits personally in the temple and he's going to destroy all competing worship so that the only worship allowed in the second half of the tribulation period is beast worship. And so ultimately the Antichrist will not tolerate any worship except that of himself. And so he's going to burn her with fire. Once his power has been consolidated, the Antichrist no longer needs the help of religious Babylon. And he will work to dismantle and destroy her and her one world religion. And again, we said this is how tyrants work. They use religion. It's always interesting when the new election cycle occurs here. Almost every president I can remember claims to be born again because they want the vote, the vote of the religious right. <laughs> and so they'll use religion to gain their end, right? To gain power. Uh, and uh, and it's very rare to meet somebody who is the real deal. Uh, there's a lot of phoniness and that's going to happen. So all the riches she possesses will be confiscated. Can you imagine how this is going to enrich the beast kingdom? When, when apostate religion Imagine the buildings, the cathedrals, the mosques, the mega church campuses will be confiscated. All her pomp and pageantry, ceremony, special garments will be set aside. Her secret iniquities will be brought to light. The destruction of this religious system will be complete. Beast worship alone will stand as the new way forward for modern enlightened man. And notice this. In verse 17, it says, God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his will. Isn't that amazing? Their kingdom handed over to the beast, their destruction of the, the whore, God is going to put it into their hearts. God will give the world just what it wants, in a sense. They're going to cooperate. It wants a godless religion and a godless ruler. That's what it wants. And God will give them what they want. But he, he's, again, they're fulfilling his will. Why? Because he wants the false bride destroyed before the true bride will be revealed. And so uh, the announcement, it's interesting in Revelation 14, the announcement of the doom of religious Babylon in chapter 14, verse 8 and there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, is followed, verse 9, by the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image, receive his mark in his forehead or his hand, the same shall drink of the wine. So interesting, chronologically, after Babylon has fallen, religious Babylon, the next thing we're introduced to is beast worship, people taking the mark of the beast, worshiping his image. So that is exactly what will take place. It's interesting as you look at history, I'm just going to give you one example, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5, the Assyrian, remember the Assyrians were used to take Israel into captivity, northern kingdom, but God calls the Assyrians a rod in his hand. And that's exactly what's happening here. These 10 kings, they're going to think they're serving the purposes of the beast, but they're actually fulfilling God's purposes. God makes the wrath of man to praise him. So we get to verse 18. The woman which thou sawest is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now, what is that great city? Well, in John's day, certainly the city that ruled over the kings of the earth was Rome. But it's not Rome, because remember Babylon is in a sense that 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 system that has ruled over kings, going back. Remember the seven kings going back to Egypt and to Assyria, to Babylon, to Medo Persia, to Greece, to Rome, and so it's bigger than Rome. 
It includes it, but it's bigger than it. Of course, the question is, how influenced am I by religious Babylon? <laughs> Does it influence me? Am I enamored by its pomp and ceremony, by its wealth, by its ornate uh, ceremonies? Or do I love the simplicity that is found in Christ? <laughs> Lord, deliver us from any smell of religious Babylon from our assemblies. <laughs> May God encourage us with these thoughts.